I have for you all, um, as stated there, the leadership organizational psychology and culture training for today. Um, we're going to actually have two speakers today. We have Dr. James Baird and Ms. Uh, Eileen Vareja. So I'll share a little bit of information about both of them. Um, ladies first. And so I'll start off with Mrs. Barejas. Um, she is a nine year healthcare instructor at the Southwest University. Um, she started her teaching career as a medical assistant instructor. She's currently teaching various programs such as health administration, billing, coding, et cetera. Um, she was actually nominated teacher of the year in 2019, but actually received the award in 2018 uh, from Southwest University. And she has many years of leadership and healthcare experience. So she'll be co-presenting with uh, Dr. James Baird. And of course, um, Mr. Baird, for those of you that know him, he has a, a very long um, history within El Paso and he's very well known. He has a PhD in business with an emphasis in organizational management and he specializes in leadership. And he also earned a Master of Business Administration with a specialization in healthcare management. He is certified uh, within the uh, Allied Health Instructor and a Fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives. And he is considered uh, by many as a leadership expert. And so with that, I present to you Mrs. Eileen Barejas and Dr. James Baird. Well, good afternoon. Um, again, I am Dr. James Baird. Uh, this is Miss Eileen, and we are here today to talk about leadership, organizational psychology, and culture. And you might be thinking in your head, why is that important? Well, number one is because we're dealing with human beings. Number two is all organizations have a psychology and have a culture. So with that being said, let's start talking about positive leadership. What is positive leadership? Positive leadership is an area concerning leadership styles, behaviors, and techniques that are considered deviant, atypical, or positively deviant. And what we mean by that is it falls outside the normal range of what most people think a good leader is. What most people think a good leader is, well, it's wrong, okay? Positive leadership is a general term where several different leadership theories may live in that one positive leadership mindset. Some of them uh, that are best known are authentic leadership development, transformational leadership, charismatic leadership, servant leadership, which is, which is where I land, and spiritual leadership. Positive leadership involves experiencing, modeling, and enhancing positive emotions. Leaders are interested not only in the bottom line, which I know is important, we have to keep the lights on, but the employee's development. Leaders have high self-awareness, optimism, and most importantly, personal integrity. Positive leadership explores topics like positive deviance and behaviors that indicate loyalty, commitment, and willingness to go above and beyond. And that's really what we want our employees to do is to go above and beyond, okay? And change management, of course. And anybody that doesn't believe in change man man bleh, excuse me, management didn't live through 2020 because literally things change overnight from one day to the next. And that's when you learn to adapt, adjust, innovate, and move forward, okay? There are many positive leadership styles that can add engagement, empowerment and productivity to the organization. And this is key and it's super important because this is where we need our employees to be. For instance, authentic leadership style has four caveats. Self-awareness, which is constant knowledge of one's own character. You know yourself, you know yourself, okay? Um, also feelings, motives, and desires, okay? Rational transparency, internalized moral perspective where we're consistently doing the right thing, okay? Which breaks down to a sense of ethics, really, and that's so important. And balanced processing, which equates to being fair and open-minded. I have learned over all these years of leading people that they come up with the best ideas. 
It's amazing. So we have to keep that open-mindedness. Uh, these are all key aspects of an excellent leader. When speaking of positive leadership, one of the first styles that always comes up the most, and I hear this a lot, as transformational leadership. Here are the leaders have strong ideals and are like, trusted, and respected by the staff. Now, here's the thing. If you're not trusted, game over. Because we're not going to follow anybody we don't trust. That's for sure. Okay? Most employees will not follow any leaders they don't trust or respect. Leaders motivate and inspire staff on a constant basis. And this is what we need to do. This is how we get them moving forward to the mission and vision. They promote creativity and innovation through open-mindedness and not threatening inquiry of ideas. It's okay to ask why. It's all right. It's all right. But we have to do it in a non-threatening way. Because remember, ideas, our ideas are like our children. Okay? And we, we cling to them big time. Okay, individual consideration is one big trait of the transformational leader. That's important, okay? It's treating the follower as a unique individual and every single one of our employees is a unique individual with, dis with distinctive strengths, weaknesses, and needs. And, and I'm gonna give you a great example of that. When I started working here, they asked me <laughs> if I wanted to teach Excel. And I was like, oh no. You're going to have a bunch of upset students because I don't like Excel. I'm not good with computers. I turn them on. I expect them to work. That's it. So they understood that. So they moved me to where my strengths and needs are. Okay. This is a key ingredient in getting employees motivated, engaged, and having that feel of empowerment. The empowerment's key because empowerment gives us a feeling that we're in control and no one likes being having that feeling of being out of control. That's a scary thing. That, that's why so many people and so many organizations struggled in 2020. Charismatic leadership is a subtype of transformational leadership and has many of the characteristics that are, that are in, that we see in transformation. Charismatic leaders are very skilled at communication. And that's a key proponent of leaders when I do Consulting, one of the, I ask them, what are the three big things that you find are problems? Almost every time, one of them is communication. So it's really important. These types of leaders have a way of getting people to follow the path that's necessary in communicating the vision and mission of the organization and getting the employee to move the organization closer to that vision and achieve the goals of the organization. Because if you get closer to the mission and envision, guess what? The goals of the organization get accomplished. One final style is servant leadership. And this is where I fall. Servant leaders embroil specific traits. Empowerment, giving them that sense of control. And development of employees, and that's key. If you're not training, you've got problems. And this is what I see all the time. I'll go out and I'll ask, when was the last time you had training? Five years ago. You know, like, <laughs> wow. Expressing humility. That's key. Nobody likes an arrogant leader. Authenticity, interpersonal acceptance, accepting everybody, including them, and stewardship. Nobody wants to feel like they're not included. So what did the facts suggest? Everybody knows I'm an analytic guy, so you know, you know this was coming up if you know me. The facts are very clear about the above leadership styles. Positive leadership styles link the better outcomes. And as a leader, what is our goal? Better outcomes. Negative leadership and transactional leadership just doesn't work. Negative for sure. That will fail for sure very quickly. Transactional, transactional leaders don't last in the long run, okay? Because it's not just about getting it done. It's about how you got it done. These styles have been found to contribute significantly to employee performance, job satisfaction, and the workplace going well beyond the expected effort margins, and that's what we want. Also, servant leaders tend to attract better talent. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir here because I'm talking to a bunch of HR folks, but what are you trying to do? Attract better talent. That's what servant leaders do. Staff enhancement. Because we're going to have to enhance the staff to become major competitive. And both individual and team performance improvement. Okay? Positive leadership is about having good relationships with your employees. And here's the thing. 
Leadership is about relationships. And I'm not saying make them your best friend. I'm just saying you've got to have a relationship with them or they're not going to follow. Understanding other points of view, not pretending to have the right answer when you don't. If you don't know, just say, I don't know. And creating an atmosphere of innovation and creativity where they can adapt, adjust, innovate, and move the company forward and themselves. Now we're going to get into something really cool. And we've all been in the flow state. The flow state constitutes the emotions experienced when tasks are going well. And the employee feels in the flow or in the zone. I know you said, oh, I'm in the groove or I'm in the zone or I'm in the flow. The theory is if employees have the perception in this way, they're more motivated and engaged in day-to-day -day activities. Staff then have a subjective experience that is pleasurable. Why leaders say, I'm going to make it a living hell and at work every day, and they're going to be productive. I don't get that. Because let me tell you, they're not going to be productive, I guarantee you. Okay? Employees describe a current or a flow, almost like electricity, throughout the activity. This adds an experiential involvement to day-to-day -to -day tasks and increases creativity, innovation, and effort. This, in turn, can increase productivity, profits, and facilitate a competitive environment. So the challenge skill balance, the flow state requires a balance between the staff member's skills and the challenge of the task. When employees have a task that they're not adequately trained, well, guess what? Or they're not adequately educated in, they're not gonna do it very well. They're gonna have negative emotions, okay? We can't have them negative, having negative emotions, especially if they're face fronting, taking care of customers. If the task is too easy, they may become disinterested and disengaged. It is important for the team member to experience the flow and become actively engaged in the task and not overwhelmed by the activity. Proper training is the name of the game. And we do a lot of training and we need to do a lot of training because people aren't doing it. And the training, they become masters and they become highly productive. They get in the flow and the optimum state of engagement occurs, rendering the staff member highly engaged and confident at whatever task it is. This in turn increases productivity, which is the name of the game. So we also have to have clear low goals and unambiguous feedback. To be in the flow state, one must refute the incompatible demands of the task and focus on the next step. Setting defined goals is key here. There are positive correlations between flow state and performance goals. Because when they get into the flow, they become highly performance. And you can, you can take that into sports. Because when you see somebody, it doesn't matter the sport. When they're in the flow, they're unstoppable. I'm going to pick on Michael Jordan. But when he was in the flow, he was impossible to be. Impossible. He just took over the game. Okay? While positive feedback can come from different areas, its goal is to let staff know they're succeeding because they need those short-term wins. And they also need to know what they need to do every day to be successful. Because if they're successful, the organization's successful. The guiding feature of flow state is the intense experimental involvement in day-to-day -day activities. How can they make the task better? Action awareness is kind of interesting. Being in the flow facilitates a staff member that is in the here and now, and this is where we need them, not on their phone. We need to be here and now. And one that is concerned with the task at hand. The activity becomes absolute and second nature. And I like to attribute to this and, and you know, doing all this, it's not my first rodeo, but when I first started, <laughs> yeah, not so much. But when I walk into that class and I'm gonna lecture, it's like flipping a switch on a light because I just get in the flow, I'm ready. And that's what it becomes. It just becomes second nature. It's almost automatic, very true. Behaviors that the company needs to be successful are ingrained in the employee and then perform naturally daily. This can be described as in the zone or in the groove or just in the flow. This is the place where we want our staff and it can be trained. So the staff can take care of the customers and make them customers for life. Because remember the 80-20 rule, 80% of your profits come from 20% of your 
customers. And those are the ones that are coming back all the time. Concentration on the task. This is immersion or total concentration in one of the key dimensions of the flow state. And believe me, to lecture to 30 students or to do training, you have to be immersed in what you're doing. What this does is it enables them to get into the state of flow and direct their attention on the task. The flow itself circumvents distractions and promotes full engagement. I sat in New York uh, in front of 2,500 people. Um, there was distractions everywhere, noise behind me, everything. But I was so immersed in what I was going to do because I needed to be that I didn't even hear any of it. The employee then concentrates on the task. It is only aware of relevant factors and ignores any unrelated elements that doesn't have to do with the task or interfere with their success as well as the organization. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Eileen. Okay, so sense of control. In the state of flow, a sense of control is present without it being cognizant. So again, when we're looking at the sense of control, this is when you actually have your employee where they just lose themselves within the work and whatever the task may be. So without the mindset of being in control, I really want you to really focus on this sentence as I'm about to read. So let's do it together. Without the mindset of being in control is a sense of control where they feel that they can achieve anything. So how many of us have actually given our employees that mindset where they can actually achieve anything? So if we haven't, then we need to get back to that realm. I know with everything that has been going on and has gone on, that we have to go back to that concept. So the concept of exercising control in difficult situations is the key to flow actuality. With the flow experience, employees have stronger control of characteristics that can lead to increased productivity. Individuals with weaker sense of control, this is when they actually lose their productivity and also may suffer the company's goals and what they're expecting to achieve. So this leads to self loss of self-consciousness. He or she shapes to others that may be the key elements of workers' work life. So think of Bob. So we all have a Bob in the environment and working. So when we go into work, we see that individual. We see the fact that we see him working on a daily basis. We, we know that he's getting the work done. And it's just so relevant that we don't even check to see his work. We don't even focus on his activities because we just know that he's getting the work done. And this is when we lose self-consciousness. So when an employee is set from free self-consciousness, he or she tends to do things intuitively, which means, again, that they take the realm of it. They don't even have anybody else second guess their work. So self-preoccupation um, um, disseminates and the employee shifts his or her focus on the endeavor, which is, again, getting the job done, getting what is expected of them. Now, transformation of time. This is my biggie. This is my favorite. So most employees can lose track of time, which can be normal, depending on the situation. Again, the experience can flow and disrupt the concept of time as the employee is completely engaged in the moment and in the activity. So we've all been, we've all been in those scenarios where we are given a task that we feel so confident in that we think that we can do it within six weeks of time, maybe a week, it just depends on what was given to us, such as a task, or as a leader to give your employees a thing, something that they need to do within a certain amount of time. And it can, for instance, if you were to give me something that has to do with business or marketing or numbers per se, that will take me forever to get done because I, I really need to focus on it. I really need to, need to take it into. But if you give me something to do with billing and coding, health administration, something to do with my realm, then the loss of time could be either a positive thing or a negative thing. Again, it could be something that I can just see myself completing within a matter of moments. 
Whereas if it's something that I'm not comfortable in, it could take forever. So this is again, where you have the transformation of time. So when you're going into the realm of your employees and giving them that task, take that into consideration. Are you giving them something that they can achieve that they feel confident in? And if they do, then you need to monitor the fact that they're doing it within X amount of time. Is it something that is gonna benefit the company because of the fact that it's been done within less of the time that you've given them to be able to achieve that, um, that, that task? So again, going to transformation of time, it just depends on the individual. So out of telic experience, here is having employees with deep allotelic um, feelings is important to the overall organization. So I'm gonna go into my experience here with an allotelic experience working at Southwest University. We've all experienced the pandemic. We've all been sent home to work from home. A lot of companies stayed that way, or if not, they stayed stagnant, which they didn't prosper. We took it into consideration that we as a group decided to continue our teaching. We decided to continue with our classes. Um, we, a lot of instructors were not innovated. We weren't tech savvy myself. I didn't know how to use the computer as well as now I do. But we said as a whole that we can actually prosper from this experience and we continued to teach and we, continued enrolling students. So going into autotelic experience is the fact of not focusing on the money, but virtually on the experience and having that student feel productive, feel innovative, and feel the overall experience <clears throat> of prospering to achieve whatever the customer is expecting. And thinking of it as a HR perspective is, knowing that your employees felt that they were, they felt valued. And again, not about money. They didn't complain about, okay, so since I'm doing this, am I gonna be uh, compensated for what I'm doing now at home? No, it's just knowing that there's an end to what we need to do. So this is driven by servant leadership. As Dr. B had mentioned earlier about servant leadership, this is trusting your leader, giving appreciation from the leader. Autotelic dimensions is the result of being in the flow of the state with entropic experiences being transferred into the flow. So the flow in the workplace settings, the flow has many advantages in the business atmosphere. Number one, encourages creative thinking, cultivates innovation and opens new business horizons. It can produce strong ideas that will increase profitability and also productivity. Flow can heighten motivation, engagement, and power among staff. This will lead to a better products and service with customer interaction. So I feel personally that this is also one of the most important things when it comes to working with your employees is making them feel that they are empowered that they actually have a sense of engagement, that their, their worth means something within your organization, means a lot to making sure that the customer has fulfilled their interaction with your employee. Now, job crafting. So now we're going into job crafting. Individuals mostly spend their work working and they, they think of this, how many of us are looking at our time and we're saying, oh, it's five o'clock, almost time, almost time to go home. So we don't want that. So this is when it comes to HR for your type of position, for instance, with us, it's just making sure that we make our job interesting. We make it as innovative as possible as we can. I, mean, I, I know a lot, you know, work is hectic, but if leaders could make our jobs a little bit more interesting, more innovative. How can we do that? How can we make this a little bit more interesting for our employees to make them just feel like if their purpose is bigger than what is expected of them? So this is the key element of job crafting. Job crafting is essential in taking positive steps 
and actions to redesign everyday work duties by changing again their tasks, their relationship, their perception, and again, their job itself. So the main assertion is the staff stay in the same role but get more meaning out of their job by changing how they do their everyday tasks. So giving you a little bit of insight working here at the university, what we do to innovate ourselves and to make things a little bit more interesting is we do a little bit of, we have balloon fights. Yes, we do. We actually do at the end of the year, usually July, June is, we end up coming up with the ideas to get our staff involved, not only just teachers, but we have our, um, when it comes to financial aid, job placements, and we go at it. We actually have a balloon fight. Why is this important to the organization? Again, it's bringing us together. It's getting us a sense of feeling that we belong and that we mean something to the organization even something as little as that. So the key types of job crafting, I'm gonna go into the three types of job crafting. So the standard definition of job crafting is an employee initiates approach, which enables the staff to shape their own work environment, such as it fits their needs. So if you were to look at your, your current employees that you have under your realm of um, HR or whatever organization that you're currently working at, and you just focus on those individuals, do you know their strong attribute, attributes? Do you know what they're capable of doing? Their strong ethics, where they excel in these areas? And this is what we, where we need to focus on the most, because if not, this is when it can become irrelevant as to job crafting. So we need to focus on those strong attributes because of the, of, again, this aids in the types of behaviors employees need to be successful in the organization and again, become crafters, them themselves. So there's three that we're gonna be going into. The first one is task crafting. When it comes to task crafting, it's the shaping or molding of one's role in the organization. It involves adding or dropping activities outlined in the job description. It, in a sense, the leader is making the task in the job, the employees, its own. So this is when you actually let your employee run with it, where you have the benefit, when you give them the benefit of the doubt that you know that they're capable of doing or overcoming what is given to them, just trusting them, basic terms. So the employee uses the mindset of extra value. So extra value here, again, with the pandemic and everything that just happened, we were given the opportunity to make our own classes online our own and dealing with the situation. So this is what I personally think was an extra value added to our organization is again, this is a type of crafting that involves changing the nature of the job, which is exactly what we did. We changed the nature of, job, of the job and we evolved with it and we took and we embraced it. So dedicating different amounts of time to what is being currently done. But the goal here, again, is to increase the quality of the customer experience, not quantity, but quality. So eventually with quality will eventually come quantity. So relationship in crafting and changing up the interactions. This is how employees can change and reshape the type of nature of how they interact with others for the benefit of themselves, as well as the company. So this is when we go back and we focus on the mission statement, our value statements within our organizations and things that we have basically probably lost in touch of. So going back and reiterating what our mission statement is and our values makes a key point as to what our, our, our position is at, in the organization and making that meaningful purpose as to why we're currently where we're at. So relationship crafting and changing the staffs, um, changing the staff on task, communication and engagement with other individuals throughout the external and internal environment. So here I can express my external would be our job sites with our students, making sure that we have that connection, 
making sure where you're currently um, interacting with other external um, environments, making sure that you're connected with those individuals and seeing what they're expecting. And then going back to the internal, which you are your employees, and making sure that the product that we're eventually processing out to the city of El Paso is at par, making sure that we're doing the best that we can, can eventually increase our productivity. So here the staff member change, changes their action to provide a better experience, not only for the customers, but also for everyone inside the out and outside the organization. Employees become positive and forced throughout the company. So cognitive crafting, the third type, this is the last one. So the third type of, of crafting is cognitive and it's about how employees change their mindsets and behavior to better match their success. By changing perspectives and perception on what we are doing daily and one can create their own meaning, many times this leads to increased engagement and feeling empowered among staff. Through job crafting and components, leaders and employees can redefine, <clears throat> reimagine, and get more meaning on what they do every day. This can bring increased benefits to the organization and job, uh, crafting items. So these are some kind of crafting items that we've come up with. So the following are some items for you to take into consideration. So here, give preference to work tasks that suits the employee's interests and skills. I started here woo, nine years ago. And the first job that I was um, assigned to teach was medical assistant. So working as a medical assistant instructor, they had asked me to teach dosage calculation. That's something that I was not familiar with. I'm not mathematically savvy. And when it comes to prescriptions and calculating the dosages, I wasn't too familiar with. But at the time I had an, a director, Mr. Segura, Dr. Segura now, and he said, you can do it. You can do anything. If I believe in you, you can believe in yourself. So having that perception that I can actually do something that I didn't feel comfortable in doing, this is again, crafting your staff and getting the rounds of what you think that they're able to do, but they, though they don't think that they can do, that's innovation. That's compromising the crafting skills. So organize special events in the workplace, encourage work uh, groups. So I did get a mentor. I did have a mentor that was given to me to help me um, better myself when it comes to <clears throat> classes that I was not familiar with. But that just makes you individually a better person along with the organization as a whole because it makes us stronger. And that's the whole point. So assign a mentor. Remind workers of their significance. What's the purpose? What's the realm of them being here in the organization? How is this making your employees a better person in the community? So again, remind workers of their significance and their work has on themselves and the company. Reassure the staff the positive effects of the job has on them and the organization. So here I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Dr. Beek. Well, I know this is a lot to cover today, but it's so important, the job crafting, the flow state, the positive leadership, those are things that make a company successful. So final thoughts before we open it up to questions. Organizational leadership is a psychological endeavor, and that's because we deal with human beings. And anytime we deal with human beings, there's going to be psychology involved. Uh, not only excellent leadership, but also a knowledge of culture. Each company has their own psychology and culture, good and bad. We must keep in mind that we are leading human beings here, okay? Employees will have feelings, perceptions, and mindsets of their own. And we have to realize something, your perception is your reality, okay? So those perceptions and feelings and mindsets can be cultivated to achieve the mission and vision of the organization. And eventually that's what we want to do. This will take a keen understanding of what motivates 
empowers and engages the workers. And it can be different between workers, what those are. Leaders must have a sharp focus on these factors to be successful so the organization can be profitable. And that's why we, we picked this to talk about. In the end, it is the personnel, it's the employees that make your company great and profitable. They are the best and most important asset of any corporation, any company, any organization, for-profit, not-for-profit, does not matter. They are going to be the ones that make you great. Okay, with that being said, let's we can go ahead and open it up to questions. And, and the only thing that I would like to add, focusing on the crafting portion of the presentation, take into consideration that aspect of it. Go into the slides. Um, each and every one of you all are going to have this PowerPoint to save for your own personal use and just really emphasize on those, into, those slides and see if you're currently crafting your employees to be the best that they can be. Okay. Now we'll open it up to questions if there is any. Okay, we have the, the chat box is open here. And so if anybody has any questions for Dr. B or uh, Mrs. Barajas, this is the time. I have a question. Um, what would you say would be the first or maybe like the easiest first step to take in that crafting, like for somebody coming new into it and kind of looking at it? I think, I think the easiest thing to do is adopting the positive leadership style. And that's something that can be taught, it can be trained, uh, it can be mentored, but I, that's really the first step because without the positive leadership, the flow state, the job crafting, all of these things we've talked about, the empowerment, the engagement, isn't going to start. So it's really adopting one of those styles in positive leadership. And also going into perception as to what type of leader you are. There's leadership style. There's so many different type of leadership. So going and really understanding what type of leader you fall into, then that will actually help you with your crafting. And then also with the type of employees that you have. With us, it's more of a family oriented type of leadership type of style that we tend to do it more. We don't have the business approach. So you all are more of a business approach. So knowing how to craft your, your employees with the perception of, of having that in mind could actually, you know, help you with that type of consideration as to how or where to start from and reading up on it. A lot of reading helps you. I think, I think with the positive leadership also, um, you know, with the positive leadership, the profits will come, the success will come. You don't have to worry about it. I've seen this time and time again uh, over the course of my career. Thank you. I have a comment. Um, in looking at the bios for both uh, Dr. B and Sparajas, it seems that you both do uh, some type of consulting. And I believe, Mrs. Barajas, you have a small business called Future You. Maybe you can share with the group uh, what you both do in regards to consulting. Thank you. So I own my own um, business. It's called Future You. And what I currently do is I help um, El Paso with their portfolios. And I also help with resumes. And I do career counseling. Of course, I try to tend my, um, my customers to adapt to Southwest University's um, way of their curriculum. But there's a lot of individuals that have no, no, no sense of direction when they get out of high school or if they're in their late 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever the case may be. So I feel personal, personally, I was not given the direction that I should have been given. Um, so I thought that I should help individuals here in the El Paso area and then being put in my position that I'm currently in to direct individuals as to where they can see themselves in their future. So that's what I do. I help with their portfolios, their resumes, and I don't see it. So to, I, 
people really focus on five years. I don't think five years is the realm to go anymore. Years go by so quickly that if you really think about it, five years takes you with your associates into your bachelor's. So if you think of that, it takes more than a bachelor's to see your future. You see a master's degree. A master's degree took me 13 months to get. So if we accumulate all those years, we're now focused on at least 10 years from now. So this is what I do. Is I see, you, I make you see yourself 10 years versus five years. And that's what my business is currently in, along with working at Southwest University. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just had a question, a great presentation, bro. I thank you just so much. Environment tasking wall, uh, where I'm going out helping people with procedures and policies to make the organization work better. That is true, that does happen, but it's really become training. And, and that I do a lot of training. We do a lot of training. Um, we are available. We, we, we'd love to either come out live or we can do it virtual. Any, we can do any kind of training that you need, um, any kind of training that you need, uh, whether it's leadership, operations, strategic management, uh, customer service. Customer service is a huge one. That's a huge one that I do a lot of uh, because basically people don't know how to do it. And um, and it's, it's very been very helpful to a lot of organizations, but really within the consulting business, uh, I, I can almost take care of anything. Okay. And then counseling with everything that's going on with the pandemic and just having that low self-esteem and having a lot of employees just scared and just know, not knowing the direction as to where they stand. This is where we come into play. We have we have the opportunity to to enlighten the direction as to what they should be considered um, as to the direction as to where the organization should be. So with Southwest University, they've given us the opportunity to speak on behalf of their, their organization to have the structure formal, formality of COVID and what we should be doing. Since we are a university that deals with healthcare and we, we can speak in organizations such as hospitals, um, when it comes to outpatient services, inpatient. So if you know of an organization that is dealing with the crisis of not knowing what they can and cannot do, we can go ahead and, and speak on that as well, if that's something that you guys are interested in. Wonderful. And I'm sorry, Brian, go ahead, sir. Yes, so just curious as far as from a psychology standpoint with a lot of employees uh, getting back to work or in a hybrid model, what would y'all be, would your be the recommendation as far as in the communication process? Because um, you don't want to lose, you know, that productivity that they've gotten used to in the past year. You want to make sure that everything's kept on the same wavelength or even better as far as return to office. But what strategies would you all recommend as far as um, keeping everyone on the same page as far as return to work goes? Communicating every single way you can. Conference call, uh, Zoom, uh, in person if you can. Of course, we know that communication in person is the best kind of communication, but that can't be done always anymore. So use every bit of communication ideas that you can come up with um, to communicate with your people and do it on a consistent basis because for a lot of people doing this hybrid thing uh, and things of that sort is a new thing and it's going to take them some time to get used to it and get good at it you know i've seen research where when people start new jobs it takes them about a year to get really good at it so we have to think in that mindset and communicating with them in every facet that we have is and continuously. Um, one of the biggest problems I see with strategic plans is the implementation because basically it's not communicated well and it's not communicated daily. And it has to be communicated daily in every way that it's available to you. It might be conference call, might be Zoom, might be in person. Uh, it might be something like this, a virtual training. And, and we, we can do it either way, you know, like I was, I was telling Mr. Nakid, I said, we can do it virtually, we can do it virtually, or we can do it um, 
live, however they want it, we'll do it, okay? But that's what I would suggest. Communicate daily, all the time. Make sure they understand what they need to do day to day to be successful. In turn, that'll make the organization successful. And giving enough adequate time for them to adjust is a key as well. You don't want to expect your employees to do something within 24 hours and expect them to be on board because that's going to bring some frustrations. Um, we've all adapted to what we experienced our, on our own way. We have a lot of parents that decided to work from home. And with that said, they discontinued their daycare. So being considerate of every employee's needs is very important when it comes to transitioning back to normality, what we call, or now no normality. So those are key attributes to take into consideration when you want to bring back the normality and having them all engaged with what we're expected of as employees. Okay, do we have any other questions or comments? Okay, if anyone is interested, I know we sent the presentation to you all. Uh, it'll be attached in your in the email from Diana, along with your certification for attending today. And um, we'll make sure to have both their contacts within that email. And so we wanna thank you very much. You guys did an excellent job. And every time we hear you all, I always learn something different. So thank you very much. We appreciate you all. And we wanna thank you for having us and let you know that we're here to help. That's what we're here for. Thank you very much. God bless. Thank you. Thank you.